This is the Unregistered Podcast, and I'm Thaddeus Russell. This is a show about ideas, people, and behaviors that are considered inappropriate, out of bounds, or beyond the pale. The things you're not supposed to talk about if you're a school teacher, a college professor, a businessman, a politician, a parent, a neighbor, or even a podcast host. These are the things you're not supposed to say or even think if you're a good liberal, a good conservative, or a good citizen. Each week, I'll interview a person who has something bad to say. They might be a journalist or a professor. They might be a porn star or a drug dealer. They might just be an ordinary person with an ordinary job who doesn't care about the rules of polite society. I'm not interested in breaking the rules just to be a troublemaker. I'm interested in people who break the rules of conventional thought and to expand the scope of what is possible to say in our society. I'm interested in people who make me think. If you want to be a political radical, make art. This is my interview with Alec Mohibian. I am joined from Los Angeles, California by Alec Mohibian, who is better known worldwide as the filthy Armenian. Hello, Thad. Thank you for well, having me on. Welcome, Alec, filthy Armenian. Um, you, sir, have a, a remarkable podcast on your hands called The Filthy Armenian. Or no, it's called Filthy Armenian Adventures. Excuse me. Right. Filthy Armenian Adventures. Yeah, right. thank you for saying so. It is, it is remarkable. It is one of a kind. I do know that you were inspired by some other podcasts and doing it, but it stands alone. Um, I've never heard another podcast like it. We will talk about that. Um, and you have very, very interesting background. And I will say this, I guess, to me, sort of on a surface level, what I one of the things I really like about you is that you are just as interested in aesthetics as you are in politics. Um, oh, yeah, way more, I would say, actually, it's just like, you know, it's a, the, I keep saying like the, the biggest resentment I have uh, about everything that's happened politically in the last eight years, whatever, 10 years, is that it has forced me to, you know, resume an interest in politics, which is okay. the last thing I ever wanted to do in my life. <laughs> so I, I want to talk about just that. Yeah, yeah. I, was, I was curious about that. So because you started out, I mean, as a teenager, as a very, very political person, right? Oh, yeah. One of yeah. your thing. We'll talk about that yeah. in a second. But yeah. Yeah. And so, um, yeah. So your podcast, Filthy Armenian Adventures, is primarily, uh, would you call it a travel log? I mean, it's a, it's a hard thing to define. I call it a travel agency for the soul. I call it an existential travel show that takes right. you to all the forbidden territories of our cultural apocalypse, where uh, you will uh, you will meet uh, where I t where I f kind of try to lure the most enchanting characters of our time, uh, my favorite people, my favorite thinkers who are alive, my favorite creators. Uh, my favorite friends. Um, I try to lure them into these forbidden territories of our culture, all of them, art, nightlife, culture, politics. Um, and I dare them to take off their masks and kind of help me trespass and investigate in search of the yeah. truth and in search of gold, in search of joy and in search of like, in search of the kind of pieces of our culture that can be, uh, that can be recreate, re can be saved and and restored and we can like make a new kind of world out of so i it's a very ambitious and all over the place type of podcast but i think people who listen to it immediately start to get the kind of spiritual journey i'm on um and and you know it's, it goes in different directions kind of every episode sometimes there's been some that have been like almost like nonfiction dramas you know or tragedies well, yeah i mean i i that's one of the reasons i love it is that i, I love travel logs and i feel with your podcast uh, transported it's um it's the same feeling i have when i read a good novel or see a good movie um i just feel like i've been taking i've been taken to a different place uh and i'm and i'm with different people who are not you know people who are not in my life um 
and I am no longer in in my world. Uh, it, it's a it's a fantastic experience where you you travel literally around the world. I mean, you've been to multiple countries, yeah. and you've interviewed a lot of people. You you say you go um, to forbidden territories. What's forbidden yeah. about the well, place? Well, been- these are my well. Well, one of them is uh, literally uh, a forbidden territory called uh, called uh, Nagorno Karabakh. Um, officially, Armenians call it Artsakh. That's like literally the the dis- disputed territory that uh, that has been under attack for the last uh, two years uh, in yeah. a war. So that's what's one example of my kind of my the ethnic side, a literal forbidden territory. But when I use the phrase forbidden territories, I'm not talking merely about physical destinations. Right. I'm talking about all the thing. I'm talking about the territories of our culture that we're not we're, people are afraid to talk, talk about. And mm-hmm. that's not just because of I'm not just talking about the taboo subjects that we all know what they are, um, which in my show is completely uncensored, completely raw. And, you know, all the un PC, on all the un PC things are allowed, um, whether they're, whether they're true, whether they're good or not, it's like, doesn't matter. I don't think anything is off limits. So Mm -hmm. it's, it's a very, you know, it's a very scandalous type of show in that respect in terms of the stuff I talk about and the language that is, that is used, but also because like people, I've noticed that a lot of people forget politics. Um, I mean, we had this with you, like in my episode with you, you know, it began as a, in a semi-political nature, you're going to give me a tour of Berkeley Mm -hmm. and we're talking about Berkeley, your history in Berkeley, the way it's, you know, the ups and downs of the city as a political hotbed. Mm -hmm. Um, and we arrived at a very personal place with you. And that's what I was after the whole time. I mean, I wanted to know about Berkeley. Obviously, I'm interested in the political, uh, the kind of political warfare that has always been conducted at, at, at Berkeley and how it connects to my own journey. But ultimately, I was I wanted to get at like, what is it that makes Thaddeus Russell Thaddeus Russell? And I feel like we got there at the very, very end of the episode. <laughs> you know, just almost by way, almost by, almost, almost by accident. Um, and that's the kind of thing I, I mean, too, when I say forbidden territories, I mean, the parts of our lives that we ourselves are kind of shield ourselves away from. I mean, I know mm-hmm. I have. So the one blessing of this pandemic and what led to this podcast in the first place was me realizing just how much, how much exploring I had to do of all the kind of parts of my past, of my life, of my education of everything that were actually vitally important to me but for one social socially convenient reason or another or personal reason or another i had chosen to kind of stow away um and so that's that's kind of what feel forbidden territories is a bit of a you know artsy fartsy way of uh of referring to all that um well so the reason I started my podcast, this podcast, is that I had been political my entire life. I had, you know, begun listening to lots of political podcasts and found that there was a poverty about them, which was a poverty, you might say, of the soul. Yeah. Which is to say that people didn't talk about themselves ever in any meaningful yeah. way. And just what you, you know, you, I never, you never understand what makes anyone tick, you know, on a political podcast or a political news show or whatever. Uh, and so I, again, I love that about your, your show. Um, you've had remarkably um, prominent, famous guests. Uh, you've had Glenn Greenwald, you've had David Horowitz, the, what do you want to call him? The neocon or. Anti- I don't think it's even fair to call him a neocon, but I think no. you know, the, the, the ex he's, you know, the ex radical, the, the, he, he's the, the foremost radical to the foremost conservative radical basically is what he right. is and he's written the most important political memoir i think of the last half century radical son which we talked about because mm-hmm. it's so relevant to berkeley too and and mm-hmm. your and your own background uh yeah i mean he's just like a he's a a literary fi- political firebrand activist of a kind mm-hmm. you don't see anymore i don't think right uh, and you just can i say who you just interviewed or oh not? sure yeah yeah okay yeah. so you just interviewed grail marcus uh who's like maybe the dean of like rock criticism, I would say. Like he's one of the great popular music, I guess, critics uh, ever. And uh, so you've gotten very high level people. Um, how, how did you, how have you managed to do that? Well, in the case of um, s- some of them, such as, uh, such as uh, David Horowitz, such as David Thompson, the film critic, who I mm-hmm. think is the greatest film critic who ever lived. Um, mm-hmm. 
and and I was you know blessed to we, I actually ta- I actually interviewed him right before I met you. It was a back to back day. I interviewed him in San Francisco, and then I hopped on a Bart. Uh, and the got came to you and he did these two episodes back to back, even though they're separate episodes and you'll never know. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, David Thompson, I knew I had interviewed initially five years ago for a totally separate thing. I just hunted him down. I hunt people down. That's another thing I do. When I admire people, I just hunt them down. I mean, I will write, I'll write to them. I will like, I, I read all of their stuff and I believe, I, I feel this great need to connect with them. And, um, uh, and in this case, so David Horowitz, I knew back when I was a kid, when I opened a chapter of Students for Academic Freedom in my first university, UCSB, Santa Barbara, um, and that was his thing that he had start movement he had started to try to guarantee the the free speech rights of students on campus. It was called Students for Academic Freedom. So I was a fan of his. I'd read his Radical Son in high school. I'd read his many of his essays, um, and I opened up a chapter at UCSB, and so, because he's in LA. It was very easy to become to like, you know, he, he would always throw these events and I met him at, at these events and he always remained very warm and generous with his time ever since. Like I never really I kind of lost touch for 20 years, but because I got, got completely out of politics. But because I had done that 20 years ago, anytime I've ever contacted him, he's been very, very warm and open to meet up. And so that was a child that was me that was me revisiting a a very important figure from basically my adolescence with david horowitz and with others i just reach out any way i can uh greel marcus is a friend of david thompson so he made the connection and i just you know i i I try my best it's hard to get people but when you have a sincere connection to their work i think they sense that and you know and as long as their game period at all to talk on you know some people i know some people who are i'd love to have on the show who are, I think, some of the greatest people alive, but they just don't do podcasts, right. you know, at least so far. I'm trying to hypnotize them into it. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. All right, well, uh, let's talk about what makes you tick. And let's go back to your uh, adolescence and maybe let's go before then. Um, I've asked you a little bit about this before, but not really, not enough. I don't have a, an adequate understanding of you yet. Uh, so you grew up in little Armenia, right in yeah. hollywood or yeah i grew up in the little armenia hollywood uh, a combination of little armenia hollywood and then from the age of four on uh the west side um and pal you know brentwood palisades uh, uh my parents split up and when i was four and my mom's side moved to the west and my dad's side stayed on the east and these are the two this is this is the 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 giant um spiritual footprint uh with which i grew up uh i would go from on fridays my my dad's side, my grandmother would pick me up from school, take Sunset Boulevard all the way from where it ends in the West mm-hmm. to Little Armenia in the East. And we, you know, through tremendous Friday traffic, and I would spend Friday, Saturday with my dad and my grand, you know, that side of the family. Um, and I went to public school on the West side, which as I, as I, we were talking about, very similar to your experience in Berkeley, it was super diverse. One third black students from Compton, bust in one third Latino students from, uh, you know, East LA Mm -hmm. uh, bust in uh, 10% Asian, 20% white. And that includes Jews and Persians, which are at least half of the white, uh, the student population, very diverse upbringing, which I am absolutely grateful for now, uh, despite anything else politically that might be affiliated with the school busing and all that. I feel like going to a public school is very important for me. And and I played sports, so, you know, contending with what seemed at the time to be, you know, every school is different, but like what seemed like you're, you're contending with the best of the best athletically and trying to win their respect um, mm-hmm. was really important to red pilling me on all leftist bullshit very, very early on. I was red pilled basically in middle school by playing basketball for a a real hard ass foul mouthed coach from Compton who was the Ooh. janitor at the school. <laughs> but who had who drove to school in a 68 Volkswagen green bug with a giant bullet hole in the windshield. Yeah. Um, coach Leonard Owens, God bless you wherever you are, if you are alive. Mm. Uh, I've always, I, yeah, he's one of the most important people in my life. So yeah, I mean, I, I, I really, I, you know, it, when I, anytime I, any one of the things I recoil from the most is this conservative belief in homeschooling, which mm. I understand the need, I understand where it comes from. I know, I know, I mean, my whole 
personality was formed in opposition to the orthodoxy of liberal education that was uh, imposed upon me in, okay. in, in high school, but it was formed in opposition to, you know what I mean? It's like, there was no, there was no me if I was just homeschooled, uh, un, you know, with, with, a, with a certain set of uh, proper ideas and proper lessons that I had nothing to rebel against. I would have probably rebelled against the good stuff if that happened, you know, instead I rebelled against the, 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 the bad stuff. And it was super important for me. Um, and I loved high school. I think it was really important. I love public school for all its warts. And I know it's worse now, blah, blah, blah. But I do find it, I do find it problematic when I hear conservatives believing that they can shelter their way uh, to, uh, to some sort of uh, return or whatever. I don't think that's the answer. So what did you, you said though that being in a public school red pilled you? Oh yeah. How, that's usually not how it works. Why did it red pill you? Well, because I saw what public, ed I saw what fucking, what all of that means. I mean, I saw what, first of all, the very first thing that red pills, red pills you, well, as I say, the, the very, very first thing for me was playing sports mm -hmm. and being kind of bullied in an organized fashion by my coach hmm. who through, again, he would even being, even though he was black, he would be canceled instantly today. Oh, yeah. Like he wouldn't be allowed because he called everyone everything. Wow. including a lot of the n-words and especially to the black kids wow. um like it was not like it was every day it was like you lived in terror of this man and everyone quit except for like two people three people one of which was me and so surviving that was a real testament to just how you need to not be a pussy you really need to not be a pussy because there's the pussy option is open for everyone mm -hmm. you can always puss out um or you can try to win the respect of the people who are who have authority and who know better. I mean, obviously I respected his authority as a basketball, as a basketball theorist. Mm -hmm. um, and so that the process of just knowing that you have to become a man and not be a pussy was so important for me. That was my, you know, spiritual red pill. Mm. Political red pill started obviously more in high school when I started to become aware of the issues. And mm -hmm. I started to see that all the, all the complaining about funding for education made no sense because the schools that did the worst got the most money. The schools that were the shittiest got the most public money and the places that spent the most on, I mean, I'm, I'm just being general here. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm sure people can find exceptions to what I'm saying, but it was, it's plain for everyone to see that in education as in everywhere else, wherever the most kind of government money is poured is wherever's doing the shittiest. And so mm -hmm. the correlation between government money and, and an outcome is if anything, the opposite of, of positive. So that was a very easy thing to learn. Um, and, and once you kind of see that, and once you kind of see how much, how many, how many lib ideals are just based on feeling good about yourself, and not based on the facts of the case, mm -hmm. then you start to realize what you're up against, and you question everything. Um, in environmentalism, uh, you know, affirmative action, obviously, was an early one for me um uh everything like it, it's mm -hmm. and then and, and and that's that was the essence of it i saw that liberal politics is is like is based not on science and reality and logic but is just based on, on on kind of sustaining a system of feeling virtuous about yourself indeed which is, which is lame indeed um speaking of feeling virtuous or not uh, I know two things. No, I know one thing, uh, or at least I've heard one thing about the, both the schools you went to, Paul Revere Middle School and then Pacific Palisades High School. Uh, I have heard un wild stories about drug use mm -hmm. at those schools. I don't know if that was happening when you were there. Um, God, I, I, sadly, not to me. I mean, I wish it was. I was a big, <laughs> I was the most fucking, I was the most, you know, looking back, I'm sure it's, again, I'm sure blah, 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 it's gotten worse, yada, yada. Mm -hmm. um, I never did drugs in high school. I never did drugs in college either. I'm, I'm a really, what? I'm a late bloomer in so many ways. I didn't have, you know, I didn't, I don't want to get into that either. But um, I mean, I, I had a, a, my sexual awakening was much later than I would have liked as well. But uh, which is something I've been correcting, by the way, I've been correcting in a manic pace. Okay. And I've chronicled some of that corrections in, in my <laughs> podcast. So, yeah. you know, I'm out, I'm on cards on the table, but I didn't do, I didn't do shit. I don't think it was as bad as people's when my day. So my, I, I was a pally high in 99 to 03. I graduated in 03. 
Um, and, um, you know, you, there was the occasional weed bust. Mm. I don't remember any worse drugs than weed. Because back then, weed was as bad as anything, according to the mm -hmm. according to the law. I mean, mm -hmm. especially for, like, kids. I don't remember there being a cocaine thing, for example. Perhaps there was. But I don't remember any Laura Palmer stories. There were definitely some, like, weed bust type of stories. Um, and I think that's as far as it went. But I was... I was so isolated and removed from uh, the kind of traditional cool kid culture. I was like, I carved my, I carved a certain niche of respect and, you know, so-called popularity by being exactly who you see today, but in like high school version. Hmm. Um, I had a foot in sports because I was, I was a good goalkeeper for the soccer team. I was very passionate about that. Hmm. Um, and I had a, and I, I, as I became red pilled, I started like becoming kind of a class, class pain in the ass, a uh, class mm -hmm. clown and mm -hmm. challenging my teachers, but doing so in a funny and entertaining way that people that endeared myself to my, to my brethren. So by the time, by, as I kind of, progressed through high school. I also did made movies and stuff, did drag, did blackface, did everything. I was, I performed, <laughs> I performed as Tina Turner uh, at the school oh. awards show. Yeah. I, yeah, no, seriously. I mean, you call it blackface. I was just, I was just being the pe people I admired. I didn't think it would think of it as blackface. Oh. I just thought of his acting. Whoa. Alec, yeah. I did not know about this. Oh yeah. It's, oh yeah. It's out. I'm, I'm not no shame whatsoever. I, I performed from the entire school as Tina Turner senior year. I did my own choreographed number of private dancer, uh, <laughs> which, which is the name of my column at UCSB later. And, okay. and it was, everyone loved it. Um, and you know, this was before everyone was taught to, uh, to uh, re you know, re restore racism to the very first, the very first filter on life. So uh, oh. it was a brief, brilliant, wondrous period. Oh, I used to drink several cups of coffee every morning, but it had a lot of downsides for me. It made me jittery and anxious. It increased my cortisol levels, and it even produced an irregular heartbeat. But then I found out about Magic Mind, a delicious elixir that contains several powerful nootropics and adaptogens, which improve energy, focus, and mood while reducing stress. Magic Mind is now the central part of my morning routine. It helps me stay focused with just the right energy level, with no spike in cortisol and no heart racing. Magic Mind contains matcha from Japan, which boosts energy and contains huge amounts of antioxidants, ashwagandha from India, which reduces stress and anxiety, Lion's Mane and Cordyceps from British Columbia, which increase endurance and reduce inflammation, as well as vitamins B and D3, which support cognitive performance and boost the immune system. Go to magicmind.co slash unregistered and use my discount code unregistered20 to get 40% off your first subscription or 20% off your first one-time purchase. My 40% off code only lasts 10 days though, so hurry. Again, go to magicmind.co slash unregistered and use my discount code unregistered20. Thank you. Oh, my goodness. Blackface and drag? All at the same fucking time. At the same time? Yeah. And mm. I'm not even a drag race gay. I don't even watch. I'm mm. never going to watch drag race. This was a proto drag race. Fuck be, drag race. Be this still is my heart. Three. Yeah. <laughs> don't oh get too excited. <laughs> do, you know, did I, do you know about my, uh, my work on black drag queens? Do you know that I'm a, did I tell you about this or you know about this? No, I, I mean, I'm, I'm aware that they must be part of the renegade parade that you've chronicled your, your entire life, I would guess, but I don't know about your specific work with black drag queens. No, I am, I am the, this is true. I am the leading historian of black drag queens. Oh shit. Yeah. I wrote a, I wrote a very, um, very long, very detailed and very popular, uh, article for American quarterly, which is the top American studies academic journal. Um, but long before I did any of this before, the no podcast, kidding. Before, yeah. And that was, that's the most exciting scholarly work I've ever done. Who's the, who's yeah. the, I, now I'll, I threw the first brick at Mark Taper auditorium in 2003 at that show that I performed, but who was the first black, like the famous black drag queen? When, well, when and who there, I mean, it begins in the in the 20s, 1920s, uh, maybe 1910s, but in Harlem, in South, South, South Side Chicago, LA, there were just, there were drag clubs uh, or bars that would have drag shows and all the whites would come in from the, from the fancy neighborhoods to go slumming and watch the drag queens. 
Right. And, and then this became um, a huge thing after World War II in the 40s and 50s so that Ebony and Jet magazines, right, the weekly magazines that every African-American in the country subscribed to or, or, or read, every single week in Ebony and Jet, they would have huge like center spread features on the local drag show. And they would have pictures of men dressed as women dancing with other men and they'd be black and white. And, um, and it was just the most radical subversive thing I've ever seen in American history. And then what happened was the civil rights movement comes along and says, Oh, wait a minute, we're not going to get citizenship if they think we're a bunch of queers and, and fruits. So we've got to clear that up. Right. So they crushed it and they stopped, they stopped covering the drag shows in Ebony and Jet and Martin Luther King actually made some denunciations yeah. of, of black preachers who were very, who were clearly queer. Mm -hmm. um, and also by extension, the drag queens, but it was, and so they shut it all down by the 1960s. And then people have forgotten that there was a drag, a drag history goes yeah. all the way back then because it then it reemerged with RuPaul's Drag Race in the 80s, 90s, I guess. I'm really uh, sick and tired of white supremacy keeping a uh, black drag queen story hour down, personally. I mean, I think that, and you yes. know, some, something that I've noted, I, re I really actually came to, rem I was reminded by uh, reading all of Griel Marcus's work ahead of our interview was the extent to it. This is completely a uh, memory hold, by the way. I mean, nobody knows this. I don't think any black people know, I'm not any black people, but I don't think that, I don't think that it's part of the conversation at all. The degree to which the, the, the conflict in the black community between devout Christian uh, black population, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the prevailing, um, basically the prevailing cultural mm -hmm. uh, orthodoxy of black, of black culture and the the musicians the blues musicians who deviated from that musically and who 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 used gospel uh roots who used gospel music in a in a non in a, in a non-gospel manner that yep. was like people don't realize it's like it's all just sort of a this cliche now that some people are like oh yeah that kind of happened nobody really knows it was it was a major mark of tension and creative ferment uh, like yeah. it, it led to major excommunications when black people, when black musicians like Robert Johnson and, you know, on down the list were doing that and Ray Charles and everyone like that was like a major provocation to their own communities. And Indeed. people don't even know this. And it was like, it's a huge, hugely important element of American cultural history. Cause that's what rock and roll comes from. That's, that's where exactly right. everything fucking comes from. So, yep. so that's, yeah. that's what I was writing about. Um, right. Yeah. And I've written about that all, also in Renegade History of the United States. Yeah. I mean, W.E.B. Du Bois hated jazz music and told black people to only play and listen to classical music. Martin Luther King didn't mention the word jazz until the 1960s when it was like super established. But in the six in the 40s and 50s, King hated all that stuff. And he denounced rock and roll. Absolutely. As, as Satan's yeah. music. Yeah. And every I mean, every major Jesse Jackson denounced disco 20 years later, every major civil rights leader in this country has denounced black music, every one of them, and dancing especially. Um, yeah, because again, they they wanted to assimilate so that they could get for what they called first class citizenship, become considered, you know, full Americans. Right. And they, you couldn't do that if black people looked debauched and degraded and queer. So, yeah. yeah. No, um, it's a, it's a Taylor's oldest story. time. Yeah, exactly. no, for sure. It's 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 super important because of, of what it created. Like that's the part that everyone looks at everything now in terms of the march of racial progress. What they ignore is that there were actually that there were actually creations that came out of a, a true, honest tension and conflict. Like uh, it wasn't all just this black versus white long procession of. Uh, a political struggle there it was a lot it took a lot of internal struggle and it took a lot of complete individualists mm -hmm. and, and and you know hedonists and whatever but possessed mm -hmm. people people who are possessed lit to the point that people say it's literal in the case of robert johnson in the yep. case of skip james uh like possessed to create something out of this life that they had and to and to sing their way to to, to the grave basically mm -hmm. um like it created a lot and we don't have well we do have tensions now that create things for sure i think i don't want to like that sound like a doomer um but but you know the all the political kind of conversations now are so so scrubbed from any kind of genuine 
uh, elemental uh, dramatic conflict that 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 pits two true, two equally powerful forces against each other. They're so fake and gay, as we say online, <laughs> fake and gay. Yeah. Um, speaking of fake and gay, uh, so let's get back to you being a drag queen. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. Or a blackface drag queen. Oh yeah. Big time. Um, I mean, you did some really bad things there. Oh yeah. I all, mean, all that, at once. Thankfully the video from that performance, or as far as I know, was actually lost. I do, however, did make a video in 10th grade in which I played a, one of my five characters Two, one of two of which, or one of which was a woman, one of which was like a French detective, and yada yada. One of which was like a German Nazi scientist. I also played like a Jesse Jackson reverend character, in which I was also a male non drag blackface. Cool. Again, I didn't see it as blackface. I wasn't doing Al Jolson. I was like literally just black, right. and I was I passed. I think because I went to Baja Fresh in the middle of the shoot to eat, <laughs> and I think I passed. So yeah, and I have that on VHS. So you know, I'm keeping that under lock and key. <laughs> It's all just, you know, it's all just fiction. I'm just making this up. Don't don't take me seriously. The, the people at, at Baja Fresh thought you were actually Tina Turner? Or you know, they, were... they thought I was out. No, they thought I was Jesse Jackson or his oh, Jesse son. Jackson, sorry. Yeah, right, I was, right. at that point, it was Jesse Jackson. Yeah, right, right, right. So, um, yeah, so, I mean, um, so you're a goddamn drag queen. I mean, in high school. Yeah, uh, that's that's being out there, as they say. I, you know, w was that? part nope. of your sort of sexual identification at all or was it implicated not at, all, not at the time not at the time at the time i thought i was a, I, I didn't start to have this is how good at keeping a secret i am i didn't start to suspect that uh like i didn't start to suspect uh, i mean until the age of literally 22 i didn't start to suspect that i even i might be gay um and it and i remember exactly the moment it happened huh. um yeah i, I the, the very first thought time I thought oh shit what, what, what's going on here and it was an apple pan have you ever been to apple pan on um yes. on pico on it's pico like, yeah yeah the yeah, burger yeah. place yeah, yeah. Uh, the the classic burger diner somewhat mm -hmm. overrated but still still cool um you know because they their thing is their burgers don't have tomatoes they have like a tomato paste instead right but they're good their fries are good good place yeah. I was there it was the end of senior year at UCLA at this point I transferred to UCLA end of senior year I'm there and you'll never believe what it triggered these complicated thoughts and then would haunt me for a few years before I acted on them but it was the presence of a really hot guy <gasps> no way yeah, I was a hot man so I was I was homo pilled by a hot man yeah I just like looked at him and thought oh shit I mean, he was so hot. You have to, you know, like he, it's a type of hot, like sometimes now you'll, if you're me or if you're a man, you go, you'll see a beautiful person in public and it might ruin your day, you yeah. know, just because it just, you just can't think of any, like you had shit to do. And now you're like, there's this really hot person across the bar or whatever. And you just, you're just like, fuck. And if your mom calls, you have a kind of hangdog depressed voice and she doesn't know why. And you, and you're like, it's, it's not, it's not a big deal, mom. It's just that I, you know, I just saw this hot person. <laughs> um and in that case it basically r ruined my life but for the better ultimately i i, I would say was he a customer or... yeah i mean he was it was also there was a there was a very weird scenario around around him because he was a customer with a this disgusting slob uh he was there with a disgusting slob mm -hmm. and he was like picking like a like a real like you know i'm using this word slob in the most objective sense like this guy was not just enormous but like like just just you know disheveled and mm -hmm. just nasty um and and he was at some point he was like picking and this is and, uh, and next to him is this gorgeous mtv style in a in a crew in a, a po black polo shirt with the biceps just showing like the half of the bicep you know like mm -hmm. the perfect half of the bicep just to get you thinking mm -hmm. and uh just to just to fucking fuck with me personally it's just like me yeah. individually <laughs> um and then and then and then the slob guy so he's with they're with each other and the slob guy is paying for it. And then the slob guy is asking for change for like several hundred dollar bills. There was an escort vibe to it, I think, that somehow oh. somehow dangled and it, it made it all seem oh. even more like risque and something was going on. It was a very strange, uh, uh, strange scene. And that's that's the very first time that it started to hit me. Now, of course, in retrospect, you can look at certain clues, like the fact that I was Tina Turner in high school and the fact that yeah. I watch, you know, I, only, I, re I literally found my, my father's Playboy collection 
uh, and like I, as a in high school, he had a massive Playboy collection. I literally found this is the first issue, nineteen sixty seven. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I went through all his Playboys, but literally to read the articles because I was into literature <laughs> and like they had all the great all these great writers. I mean, it's this true. one there's like Borges has a story in this one. You know, like wow. it's crazy. yeah. It's true. Uh, so you could you could look at the fact that I I read Playboy for the articles. You could possibly <laughs> look at the fact that I watched Girls Gone Wild for the guys. I mean, I was for the guys oh. ultimately. Um, mm -hmm. There were some good guys, you know. There was some. It was you know like you could probably find these like little clues, but mm -hmm. um, they didn't occur to me in a conscious manner until quite late. So this the sports thing is kind of a curveball. Yeah, that's how that's how I became who I am. Like that was my whole life up until well, a certain point. Well, not a very gay thing though. No, that's right. Well, that's yeah, it's right. not. But that is probably the most. Uh, that's probably the most. Although the, it was the, soccer, though. Soccer's fair. No, no, no. It started with basketball. Don't, oh. don't. Yeah, don't try to gay shame me with soccer. It nice. started with basketball. That basketball was my passion. The only reason I converted to soccer is because I was just a better at being. And first of all, I was a goalkeeper. I wasn't your typical ronaldo short like i, I wore pants <laughs> yeah i wore a beautiful uh you know flamboyant jersey mm -hmm. i had i was an individualist that is a very everyone will tell you who's a soccer fanatic that the goalie is like a crazy individualist figure in mm -hmm. in, in myth, mythologically so it made perfect sense that i was going i was just better at it and i and and uh, you know i wasn't good enough at basketball by high school i just wasn't good enough so i had to and it was the sports were happened at the same time in la winter sports so literally you, you couldn't be both basketball and soccer you had to choose one since yeah. they were both winter sports and the games happened on the same days so i had to go to so i had to like transfer to soccer but i grew up playing basketball that's why i have my easy basketballs here signed by kobe and stuff um basketball was what i played all day every day and as much as it seems like it's totally alienates me from gay people no, no gay people like sports except like one in a million right um and I actually lesbians that's what Le lesbians, lesbians like yeah right but then how, how many lesbians are left in this world not very true. many no they're all no it's true they're all they're busy cutting off their breasts yeah they're vanishing they're vanishing yeah. and they're taking the entire pussy bear they're shifting the entire pussy paradigm with them because they're vanishing gays are starting to act like lesbians got uh, straight guys are starting to act like women and women are starting to act like llc's so it's all <laughs> fucked up because of the vanishing lesbian at the very pill you know the very like pillar of it but mm -hmm sports also is like the kind of gay that i am because it is i'm not a daddy issues gay and we don't need to go into the whole thing about i don't know if your audience cares about gay shit. uh but i am like i the the kind of heroic sports figure that i always aspire to be is kind of like what to most normal gays who are born gay or whatever you know they're they're always like alienate the, the the story you common story you get is that boys are some for one reason or another alienated from other boys i wasn't alienated from other boys i had nothing i, I hung out with other boys all right. the time all my friends were straight guys but i was alienated from the great you know like the kobe bryant figure that i that i longed to be i was alienated mm -hmm. from the randy and ideal of what i wanted mm -hmm. to be because i wasn't talented enough so that might have created the sort of uh you know fucked that's that that's probably formulated my sexuality in a certain way well how's that because you couldn't be, because you couldn't be a, a sports superstar like, yeah because i couldn't be a sports superstar the 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 type of guy who was kind of ended up becoming my uh you know romantic ideal oh. one might say i'm just speculating here you know i don't gotcha. know i don't know shit i'm just like i'm just trying to analyze it so it was actually part of it's just a very it's just a very uh different path than most arrive at at at, at the uh, at planet gay you know so you were a huge kobe bryant fan is that right well wait. huge kobe bryant fan huge ucla football fan another thing being a ucla football fan is another thing that'll turn you gay because like really yeah because they've done ever since 1998 it's been like you know one season after another of extremely good looking men full of promising talent who inevitably disappoint so <laughs> i've always felt like if ucla had been better at football the last 25 years i probably would have turned out straight fascinating so was kobe playing when you were a kid when you were oh yeah okay so when you became a kobe bryant fan yeah what, what were your feelings about him and my, how were those feelings different than say mine might have been um, well, I didn't have any conscious feelings that were different from yours might have been, although I did feel like, uh, first of all, he ran his fingers through my hair. I was Whoa. a ball boy. I was a ball boy. In That's a, racist. 
well, it was, but I, you know, I didn't have a problem with it um, <laughs> because course. it literally said I, I, I was telling this on my second podcast, The Back Wall, which I ha- which is a sports podcast that I do with us with a straight oh. gentleman named Glenn Rockney, huh. who, who does rare candy. And we do a reactionary play by play on all the sports like scandals of the past hmm. um, called The Back Wall. So um, shout out to that. But we just had Amanda Milius on and we were talking about Kobe because mm-hmm. he just anniversary of his death just passed yeah. a few years, right. a few days ago. And, um, uh, you know, Kobe is a very important figure, not only to my life, but all and not and, you know, perhaps to my sexuality, but also to the city of Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. Uh, people don't realize that he was like this mythic hero of Los Angeles, the likes of which th- th- there are very few. This like Kobe. I've made the case for Vin Scully, the voice of the Dodgers for oh, 60 yeah. years as another oh, yeah. one. Oh, sure. In a very different way. Um, uh, and and there aren't that many because people don't think of L.A. People don't care about L.A. in that way unless they're from L.A. like I am. Right. Um, and so for Kobe, is this individual, like he's an, basically he's an immigrant. Uh, mm-hmm. He grew up in Italy. He was always an outcast. Mm-hmm. He didn't get along with other players because he was just weird. He was always an individualist. He, of course, was absolutely possessed of a, completely deathless passion to be great that that outworked led him to outwork everyone in the manner of an Ayn Rand character uh, yeah. Ayn Rand hero um so I we all not just me but at the time in LA I don't know I mean you were probably here for some of it like everyone really related to Kobe there were a few people who were didn't like him for all the reasons people don't like forceful personalities who are somewhat off-putting yeah. but but the vast majority of LA people connected with him over Shaq when it became a, con- a conflict because hmm. Kobe was the one who gave, who was completely deathlessly committed to his vision of, to, to vision of greatness and the, in the, in the last frontier of the Western world, which is LA. Like this is connect so much to why people come to LA, why people, what people are up to in LA. It was the Kobe Bryant arc. So I connected to him greatly. I was a ball boy his second season. He came out of the locker room. He oh. ran his fingers through my hair and he said, damn, you got an Afro too. Because I <laughs> did. I had an Afro growing up and it was very thick. So, you know, who can say what, what, that, what that created down the line? As a, is not a, it was not a Jufro. It was an Armenia. Fro. It was an Arfro. It was Arfro. an Arfro. Yeah, an Armenian Arfro. Fro. Okay. Yeah. But dang, if it didn't look feel like an Afro. I mean, that shit was thick. I, it's gone now, but like... I had a thick ass fro my entire life. That's I mean, fabulous. I, I could smuggle fentanyl in that fro to a degree that would make G proud. <laughs> How the hell did you become a ball boy for the Lakers? It's a one time thing. It was like oh. a one one game thing. Yeah, I was a ball boy for a few years for UCLA, but uh, for a reason because I was very tight with um, the whole UCLA program. Uh, but the uh, Laker thing was like one of those things you win in an auction type of thing, you know? Yeah, You're, my um, dad. So uh, I, I need to talk more about the gay shit. Oh, okay. I am super interested in it. And oh, I how interested are you, Daddy? Is quite. Oh, okay. Well, well yeah. <laughs> no, just I, well, no, sure. Uh, why not? No, uh, I, I I encourage interest from a platonic <laughs> from a platonic point of view more so than any other. So well, I just funny. I just happened to be talking about this uh, just yesterday, in fact, um, with someone I know um, about someone they know, but it was. You you uh you said you didn't know you were gay until you were twenty two. When you I saw didn't start this... to I didn't start to consider it until I was twenty two. I didn't start to Sweet. act on it. Yeah, consider it. it didn't even occur to me consciously. I mean, I had um. So that's yeah. I had literally seen by accident in freshman year of college a porno I was watching. Porno. You guys know what porn is? I don't know if your audience is a banned porn type, so eh. I have to remind them. There's Ish. this porn, yeah, okay. There's this graphically sexual, <laughs> for purely sexual, obscene purposes created video that I was watching as a freshman in, in college. Don't cancel me. And at one point, it was like a threesome. And at one point, the guy goes down on the other guy, and I was like disgusted. I was Ooh. like, I let, I felt like, I mean, I t- immediately turned it off. I had no, there was no arousal. What's uh-huh. it completely killed it for me. Huh. So yeah, anything that suggested of of uh, ostentatious. Uh, as as Mencken called it, non Euclidean sex was not part of my uh, thing, you know. Uh, so until yeah, and then I you know I, the the thought, as I said, the hot guy at the apple pan, the sto- the tale of the hot guy at the apple pan and the black polo, short sleeve shirt, uh-huh. collar so- short sleeve shirt, and then um, and then uh, you know I wrestled with that for I went to D.C. after college. 
I did like journalism internships at DC. I reported for on Congress for roll call. I worked for the Washingtonian magazine as an editorial intern. DC, very gay town, very oppressive. And that's not gay in the fun way. No. It's gay in the like, it's advise and consent. That is some advise and consent fucking town. <laughs> if you haven't seen that movie, watch it. It's a great movie by Otto, uh, directed by Otto Preminger based on an Ed Drury novel. And that kind of like closeted, I mean, it's the same kind of vibe you get when you watch American Crime Story Impeachment, that gray, closeted, musty, uh, DC is a, just an evil town. I gotta be straight with you. Like I oh, like, man. I will, yeah. I can talk myself into almost any town. As you can see from my podcast, I've been a lot of places and I do my best, whether it's Frisco, San Francisco, they hate when I say Frisco, whether it's anywhere that like I'm maybe not necessarily disposed to loving, I will make an effort to appreciate the place. The the one place that I'm, it's gonna be very hard for me to ever come around to appreciating, even though I'll try, I will try at some point, is fucking Washington, D.C. I mean, that place is evil, okay? Oh, I lived right. there for nine months and I felt like killing myself. I was like, got so suicidal yeah. um, in DC because everyone, this is the, you know, this is the fi my final stage with ever considering any kind of involvement with politics or political discourse, journalism, any of that shit. It was the nine months after college in DC in 2007 to eight, while there's a depression under what, you know, while there's a huge economic depression that absolutely slaughters everything millennials were raised to expect about life is mm -hmm. being slaughtered. Okay. And you don't, and, and no one, nobody know. I mean, people know it, but no one's saying any, no one can pop, no one can frame for those going through it. Just how seismic the, how cataclysmic this event, you know, this thing, this transition is like, mm -hmm. no one was there to tell millennials, by the way, uh, bat in the hatches because everything's going to be fucking, di oh, everything's fucking different for you now from now on. We don't know how, we don't know why, we don't know what's going to happen. Nobody knew what's happening. Mm -hmm. uh, in my case, the writing and just the, the writing world that I deigned to, yeah. to join my entire fucking life, you know, uh, for years was completely demolished. Um, and it was visible before your very eyes. Like there was no room anymore for the type of creative, uh, creative journal creative writing journalism literature any of it in like you know magazines of some kind of popular uh, accessible appeal they mm -hmm. practically had no time for any of it anymore the only place i was able to publish good stuff was the back of the book of the weekly standard of all hmm. magazines they had a good edited by philip terzian uh shout out to the armenian people uh he was uh that was that published good stuff in the back of the book and that I had a piece in Commentary magazine about Otto Preminger. Oh. Actually, I had I had I had a cover story in Washington City paper wow. in 2008, edited by Eric Wemple, now mm -hmm. of the Washington Post. Wow. Um, uh, God, so God bless Eric Wemple. Uh, he published a cover story by me of like 5,000 words that completely roasted in a way that I really you know very enjoyable to write roasted all the college newspapers of the of the region of mm. all the universities and that was my that was my one big dc achievement mm -hmm. before i left um and i was very i was very satisfied with that but far few and far between you didn't really have much room for being creative and that's when i knew i had to drive back to hollywood and i had to get my ass in the world of show business to get anything done at the time but dc sucked and and dc definitely made me gayer yeah that's the bottom line oh really okay oh i mean i'm just assuming because it just broke my spirit i mean yeah. if i had any chance at like i had this one flirtation with a catholic girl over one night at a conservative conference early in my that first summer that was the last mm -hmm. time i seriously you know considered a uh, romance with a woman so mm -hmm. and then dc just broke she broke you know that yeah she ended up i think ghosting me because i wasn't catholic <laughs> so. I think you made a good choice. Um, <laughs> to be going, going gay? Yeah, I know. Going with the men, yeah, going with men. You know, choosing to be gay is really the, one of the best decisions I've made. I've come to realize only, you know, recently. Yeah, I'm proud of you for that. The, so, all right, so you were a blackface drag queen. Yeah. And you were a basketball player and a soccer player. Yeah. In, in high school, we're talking about. Yeah. Um, didn't yet know you were gay. Um, but we haven't even talked about this. You also were into Ayn Rand. Oh yeah. When did that start? Mine Ein. 
That mm-hmm. started in tenth grade. Uh, that started mm-hmm. with so my whole my whole um, interest in in uh, heterodox thinking and literature really took off consciously in tenth grade. Um, I started by reading stuff like by Thomas Sowell. I found a book by Thomas Sowell in my dad's library called The Vision of the Anointed, and that was truly like that was a great experience reading the vision of the anointed and then uh, there was a companion book kind of called the quest for cosmic justice also in his library i also read that i read pj o'rourke's books were oh, yeah. uh, really funny um mm-hmm. especially at the time he was really funny i mean you know he kind of mm-hmm. became uh kind of pj inc at a certain point but his but uh, he was he wrote several really funny and also smart and like sharp mm-hmm. satirically like he was good um mm-hmm. and i read i read all his books all of his books i love mm-hmm. pj o'rourke um, and I started, you know, I got involved in the, I started paying attention to the 2000 election, watching Fox News. Mainly it was talk radio that got me excited about this stuff because you're stuck in the car for three hours on Sunset Boulevard, yeah. you know, uh, every day. And you're listening to people on the air go completely ballistic in a, in a direction totally opposite what your teachers are saying. And it was a fascinating, and I've been listening to this my whole life, but once I started to you know actually pay attention oh okay you know? that's what i was gonna i was gonna ask you i mean so you found thomas soul on your dad's bookshelves yeah um and you said you've been hearing this kind of stuff this politics your whole life does that mean your parents are were conservative I, I, two, two politics two dope they were they were uh my my mom's side was democrat my dad's was republican okay and it was a major point this is all but they've all memory hold this because i i red pilled my mom when I got into it, I red pilled her real fast, and now she's the biggest. She's you know I don't even say what she is, but she she's like she's the, she, now she's but she's reached a point where she's memory hold that she was ever a Democrat. She was such a Democrat that in the in 1992, I was in second grade, and they had a mock election in my in Kenter Canyon Elementary where mm-hmm. I went to school. Mm-hmm. And uh, they had a mock election for some reason for an elementary school. They had a mock election where you would vote for, you know, Clinton or Bush senior. Mm-hmm. And under the influence, being a mama's boy, under the influence of my mom, um, especially since I lived with her at post the separation, um, I voted for Clinton. Uh, and I remember this. I will never forget the reason I voted for Clinton in that school thing. And it was because I had thought that the good people are voting. Well, you know, the good Clinton was the good guy. Right. And Bush was the villain. Right. And I remember exactly who voted for Bush as well. Like there was a few Jewish kids who must have had like one of those extremely conservative Jews. Like, I remember exactly. I remember one person's one kid who has never been part of my life since. Ben Shapiro. Close. It was like, I think it was something like Zachary stein or something berg or something it was mm-hmm. a sip yeah you know but, um something like like i remember just the one and there was maybe a few persian jews who voted for bush as, I, as i'm trying to recall but mm-hmm. I, it was one of those things where i ne- i'll never i i never forgot that feeling because when i started to get consciously red pilled in 10th grade i still had to battle this deeply deeply implanted from education from you know my mom being a democrat in the 90s Mm-hmm. Uh, this deeply implanted sense that uh, I'm you're being a bad person by accepting the truth over the the good generous empathy empathy. Yep. So there was this it was this very strong bias, and so I I know exactly what's happening when I see people who have absolutely no training and rigorous thought in in controversial questioning of any kind and mm-hmm. who you know do 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 wandering through life at some point mm-hmm. somebody tells them ah. Mm-hmm. White supremacy. There is a gen- genocide, blah, 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 blah. and then they're like instantly just you know they just they're just transformed overnight into someone who thinks they know well, something. Well, it wasn't it wasn't someone told you it was it was everyone in the world you lived in, right? Of I mean, course, yeah. West yeah. west side of L.A. I mean, my goodness, it's like a, a thousand percent Democrat. Um, yeah, yeah, all blue, exactly. It's all yeah. blue, and and that's why it's so important for a totalitarian bubble to exist. Because if you had, I mean, obviously in my case, thank God I had my dad's side. Uh, thank God I had somebody in my world wh- whom I could, and again, I, I, I didn't, this was not an, I did not, um, flower in this way in, I was very, at, at the time I re- got red pilled, I was at odds with my dad big time for family reasons that I don't want to get into, oh. but I was at major odds with him. I, I you know, major odds with him, mm-hmm. um, which is something that Ayn Rand actually, hmm. uh, was very important in 
uh, empowering me. With you know, it gave me this sense that I like I felt like I I had the goods to be my own man. So I wasn't like acquiescing to my dad's side of the you know thing. But the fact that his library had Thomas Sowell in it, mm-hmm. and the fact that like he was a there were Republicans at least, mm-hmm. at least I had some evidence that human beings are can see different ways but it's mm-hmm. clear it's easy to see how people can totally lack that evidence especially now where they the, the bubbles have tightened so you know airtight firmly around everything mm-hmm. it's easy to see how someone can i mean i saw it all happen in very various degrees through my life where one community that i was involved in or another suddenly became radicalized overnight by a few instagraphics mm-hmm. and everyone within there within just had the exact same point of view and not only and couldn't even entertain the idea that there was someone in their midst who did not agree with that point of view right. like it's one of the most it's one of the most like shocking things you can experience when you come from a time when people actually had different points of view mm-hmm. and coexisted yeah. you know yeah well i mean i would imagine that you knew you always knew that you, a person could be a republican and still be a decent person because of your father yeah i mean because of my because of yeah of course like i i i saw it all around and i i i i mean i i had no i had no yeah i never got to the point where i was like can i be a decent person and a republican uh because i yeah clearly you know my father my my there were plenty of republicans within earshot it was mostly like me personally. It was like, can I feel, mm. how do I feel mm-hmm. going against everyone on a topic that they all think is a moral issue? You know, like they think it's a moral issue. I see it as, you know, actually the tr- you're, you're, according to your own ideals, what you believe is causing more harm than good. You mm-hmm. know, you name which topic, like I'm just telling you the mechanics of it. And that's where Ayn Rand comes in. Ayn Rand comes in almost by complete um accident my teacher my 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 10th grade english teacher had a signed anthem which is her you know least significant work i mean it's mm-hmm. it's a, it's a little novella that's kind of very much in the in the kind of spirit of um of brave new world and 1984 dystopian completely dystopian little novella mm-hmm. um where the secret forbidden word is i um and ego and so and so what you know whatever i never that didn't make leave a mark on me to me that was just another little silly thing but hmm. then my teacher when i asked him for book because i had been reading you know all this shit, i asked him if there were any good books in favor of capitalism since everything was about how capitalism is bad the word itself was invented by its enemy mr mm-hmm. marx so i asked him are there any pro-capitalism books and he said well actually you know ayn rand wrote hmm. and he's a lib by the way he's a total lib but god bless him mr tim henderson um he was like a he played uh he was in a rock band called the silver tears in the early 80s that actually had like a two-year run of success um he told me about ayn rand's book capitalism the unknown ideal (laughs) and i get that book and that's what lights my ass on fire that was my sexual awakening without the sex it was just like that was like whoa because that's where she argues that everything you think is morally that's where i mean her whole thing is this but but especially contained in in that collection of essays is how all the moral assumptions of liberalism are not just fall are they're not it's not just false because it doesn't work but it's actually Mm -hmm. corrupted at the root um and that's what got me to you know really extract myself from the kind of track of conventional thinking and then i totally got balls deep into rand from there you know Wow. And, but you're like in high school, you're at Pali, right? 10th grade. Yeah. Pali. Yeah. 10th grade. Now this is the year 2000, 2001. And were you that annoying, li- that one libertarian kid in class? Totally. Yeah. But I was a comedian. So I was making it funny. Like I would do pranks uh-huh. and stuff. Like I would make fun of my, like I, you know, I would bring like fake alcohol into class and pretend I was like getting drunk. And so I was, I was, I was not a nerd. I was not a nerd. Okay. So that's what, that was, you know, I was not Ben Shapiro. When I saw Ben Shapiro, I thought that because he was almost my same age, he's just a few years right. older, yeah. but he like, you know, started as a columnist at the age of 16 while mm-hmm. I was, so it was like at this almost same time. Right. And I was like, this is the, everything I don't want to, this is like everything that gives people like me a bad name is Ben mm-hmm. Shapiro, you know, no, mm-hmm. nothing against him now, whatever. Mm-hmm. I'm just saying like that whole tone, that whole know-it-all nerdy tone is no, the way to do it, I always felt was to be, to, to like H, like aspire to be an H.L. Mencken uh, be the more interest, the most interesting person in the room, be the most entertaining person in the room, mm-hmm. be the best performer in the room, find, get your mom to buy you some size 13 high heels at Payless, black, and find a dress that makes your legs look 
Tina Sturdy and get out on the stage and do a good choreography, better than her music video of yeah. Private Dancer with a simple chair and your body and the music. And so that's how I kind of approached it. So I wasn't annoying. I mean, some of my teachers, obviously, there were breaking points, but most of them actually really liked me because I brought so much like, you know, energy to the to the topics that otherwise everyone would just sleep through, you know, because I was always yeah. like, I was always, throw, you know, creating a thing, but I, but I'd, I'd like to think it wasn't the only people who ever complained. It was only at the end of senior year in AP history. Oh, uh, no, a, AP government, something, someone, someone at some point, some Asian students were like, they're taking up too much time that should be spent on learning or something like there was something like there's some mm -hmm. shitty complaint like that but no one no cool people had any complaints okay <laughs> so how did your parents feel about having a, a black-faced drag queen libertarian for a son i don't know that they it's a good question because uh they sort of they would they went along with it pretty you know i had been perf I, I had had a performance thing uh aspect to myself going back to when i was a baby mm. so i think they were somewhat weirdly used to this idea of me as a some you know i always like to put on plays for people i always like to like i would sing and day i would like make up songs from thin air and it's like all on my fucking home videos and shit i didn't even remember this shit but i was really when they when my parents split up it put a real dent in my joie de vivre but as a toddler i was a real performer and then i kind of rediscovered that a, a little bit later on so in a way they were kind of subconsciously prepped for all that stuff huh i they they just thought it was funny and like i was just being funny and you know they like they liked it they were there was no like inquisition about it you know there were no uh, erotic inquisitions um which is probably you know which helped me be i don't know what it helped i don't know i, I didn't I, it, it it maybe it avoid maybe it delayed confrontations with certain uh horrifying glorious truths you know but uh yeah they just kind of went along with it weirdly it's not a typical thing for the world of my armenian armenian right. <laughs> what what about when you came out to them i'm assuming it was they were cool with it more, yeah yeah i mean they were you know it was late obviously in the game but they're right. cool with it and mm -hmm. and uh they're you know ultimately they're disappointed because every parents want er, not disappointed but everybody wants grandchildren and i don't blame anyone for wanting grandchildren right. and i can still i can still kidnap some i mean According to the discourse cycle, I'm a I'm a groomer, so it's not never too late to just like you know buy or go. I can go to the build a bear, the gay build a bear, where people like gay couples <laughs> find kids of some magical magical way. Like they don't have to be real kids that I have. I could just create some out of thin air. Well, yeah, that's what you people do. Um, so you were pol very political, kind of right wing libertarian ish, I guess, for many years, and you published several, many articles and pretty prominent outlets um and then you said you you stopped being political at a oh, yeah. point. when was that i mean i i had uh, diverted basically starting in college i had i i had become aware that kind of like the same way i decided to get into you know uh controversial political expression in high school and i gave up my earlier well or first of all my dreams of being an athletic star were dashed Mm -hmm. you know early in high school because i was obviously not good enough uh, i was good enough to hope to be a scholarship goalkeeper at most but i wasn't good enough to hope to be a professional anything mm -hmm. uh, so that was out the window that was my childhood dream done mm -hmm. and then but but in in middle school i had a very i was very passionately operating an, a business selling sports cards dealing sports cards like through mail order at the trade shows i had a whole ass that was my whole life mm -hmm. and i made a very conscious mm -hmm. decision when I got into to book to liter to literature and polemic and all that, mm. that I was going to pursue the art literature path, that whole thing, the mm. writing path, mm -hmm. and give up the business path because the business path, where could it lead? It had a, it could only lead to making money, which would then what? What was then? What would you do with the money? If for me, the highest, the best thing I could think of was buy the Lakers, but the Lakers, the mm -hmm. Bus family's never going to sell the fucking Lakers, no. so. I was just like, this seems like a, there's a ceiling here, whereas this path seems to go into an infinite direction, into an eternal direction. So I broke. In college, I started to feel that assuming um, my politics were mostly correct, let's say, mm -hmm. which everyone assumes, uh, 
what am I like? I am okay. So I'm a, I become a columnist in college. I start an I help start an alternative paper in UCLA. I become a columnist for the Daily Nexus in Santa Barbara, hmm. where I had some interesting. There were in some interesting explosions that occurred there. Hmm. I became I was a columnist for the Daily Bruin, and my whole thing was to be my column's name was Private Dancer. And my whole yeah. thing was to be as entertaining as you know, be as funny as possible in talk in in the various uh, topics I covered. It would, I saw them as like comedic little writing performances. Hmm. Um, not in dry, not as like dry, you know, ho, ho, ho arguments, you know. Um, but I was like, okay, all I can do in terms of dealing with political stuff is repeat the same thing over and over the rest of my life. And, mm -hmm. you know, with some maybe slightly different language mm -hmm. and maybe with some, you know, I, I could try to be funny about it. But how, how much, how many different ways can you be funny about telling people uh, that they should pay less taxes? You know, who gives a fuck? So, and I noticed middle-aged people at such institutions as Cato and wherever who are libertarian, you know, cause my politics are mostly libertarian. Yeah. Um, I, I noticed that they're just repeat, they're just saying the same banal shit over and over and over and over again. Or in the case of more creative political uh, analysts, like at the time, Ross Douthat and stuff. I mean, I, I noticed like some, I mean, I was in, all up in the blogosphere reading everyone's shit. Mm -hmm. And I was noticing that the creative political rhetoricians we're being creative by being like intentionally wrong about things. You know, it's the only way. I mean, if you, because if you, if you're, if you're, if you operate out of principles, for the most part, you're going to be either repetitive or wrong, or you're going to be creatively wrong. It's impossible mm -hmm. to be in, to be artistic about your political ideas on a day to day basis without just bullshitting. Wow. So I saw these two paths and I was like, I don't want any of this. It bores the fuck out of me. Yeah. And, I want to be, I want to create art, period. Like I want to mm. create literature. In my case, it was literature. Mm. I, I wasn't, I didn't think of movies as, even though I made so many in high school, mm. movies were not how I, I wanted to write, you know, I wanted to write like the type of stuff that I enjoyed reading. Um, and, and so it was literature that I began, like it was that element, that part of it, even the nonfiction stuff, even the, it was the literary part of it. I got into from, you know, Tom Wolfe, um, my interests expanded in the literary direction and the artistic mm. direction and away from politics starting in college hmm. and DC sealed the deal when I was in DC. Cause I, I was bet. like, I had entertained the idea that maybe you could operate artistically in a generally political stage. There was room for yeah. that because of the people I had read and enjoyed. Mm -hmm. That was not the case anymore in 2000 and at least not in 2008. Trump obviously made, brought it back to some degree to, uh, you know, but uh, for but at the time I was like, this is a dead, this is a dead arena for me, and I'd rather take my chances in uh, where it all started in, in Hollyweird. It, it does have a feeling of death, doesn't it? The uh, political life is actually- It's terrible. Political death. It's death. Or, or it's, it's death, period. Yeah, right. That's how I've always felt that way. And again, that's why I started this podcast is because I wanted to know more about people and I wanted to know things about them that, you know, could be made into what looks like art, which I do think you know, this podcast is the only thing I've ever done that I consider to be art. And I know you feel that about your podcast and about some other podcasts as well. Yeah. And in fact, you've talked about this very topic um, about podcasts as art. Can you talk about that, about your podcast and why, why is it art? Well, um, you know, I, uh... I, 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 it's, it's always difficult to talk about your own work as art because all the work is, uh, Mm. And all work is innocent of art until proven guilty, basically. So it's not up to me to say that my work is art. Um, it's up to the listeners to say that. And anytime someone does, I'm obviously flattered. Mm. Um, what my work, what my work is trying to do is create something that hasn't. It's it's trying to in, in evoke um, and 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 discover elements and portions of reality that are not currently known, but which once discovered are, are accepted to be truthful, are accepted to be uh, interesting, good. That's what I'm trying to do. That's why I'm like, I have no interest in covering territory that's already been covered. Like mm -hmm. in general, that doesn't mean that, I mean, that doesn't mean that every single thing that comes out of my fucking mouth is original or unique. It just means that I'm where I'm going, what I'm going for in each of the, any of these episodes, no matter who I'm talking to, no matter what topic we're covering is, is, is I'm trying to find a new sort of light to shed on a new sort of territory. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why I keep using the word like forbidden territory and shit. Um, so, you know, sometimes, I mean, 
that that's why I liked, you know, when I'm when I met you, I'm like, I'm not interested in your fucking takes that that I'm not interested in the Thaddeus Russell greatest mm -hmm. hits that you've where you know issued about the renegades or whatever. What right. I'm interested in in this particular case is Thaddeus Russell and how Thaddeus Russell happened from Berkeley. Exactly. How did Berkeley plus Thaddeus Russell equal unregistered? You know, how like who yep. what's going mm -hmm. on here? And and that's and you know, these are the element art is the the be the the techniques of art the techniques of comedy and tragedy and drama which if you study them are very simple um they're you know they're they involve they involve desire they involve desire for certain for certain fundamental things in life like de you know the desire for love desire for for sex for money uh for power they involve they involve uh, the reckoning with death they involve the reckoning with uh with destiny these are the mm -hmm. elemental things that that underlie every fucking work of art of all time in one way form or another like they're not that many um but all we do is pretend that we care about shit like drag queen story hour there you go <laughs> that's all we ever do because we're afraid of what actually matters so my job is to scare the shit out of people until they face something that actually matters and myself included myself yeah. included because all i do is all i do is like you know, my, so to, you know, to explain my, the general style of my podcast when it's the traditional episode versus like a studio thing like we're doing now, which I do that as well. Um, and I've had many episodes with in that manner with Jack Mason mm -hmm. uh, of, of the Perfume Nationalist, one of my favorites of mm -hmm. favorite people that I've I have found in the last few years. Mm -hmm. um, but my traditional episode is I, I'm, I'm in the flesh. I'm in, going on an adventure somewhere real with someone real in the flesh and I'm recording it with a field mic. And then I, I, I do a monologue to kind of frame what that experience was. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I have a particular agenda in mind in that experience and it's pursued, like in your case. Sometimes it's, it's, it's spontaneous. And then I frame it and every time it comes to the framing of it, the monologues, which are mostly scripted, I, I sometimes scrap three of them and I'm just like, this is not true. None of this is truthful. This sounds like a Wikipedia intro. Mm -hmm. this, is not, this is not what happened. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to figure out what happened here in my interaction with another human being in a real place where certain certain themes were 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 intended. Um, and, and it's like, it, it, you know, sometimes I succeed, I think, and sometimes I don't succeed at like tapping into something important. Um, but I'm, that's what I'm going for with this podcast. And it's a hard thing to fucking pitch. It's not an easy thing to pitch. It's not like a habitual turn this on and you're going to hear two people jibber jabber about uh, uh, about about politics or jibber jabber about, uh, you know, drag queens, uh, right. whatever it is, it's it's like all it, it goes in so many different directions. And so you kind of have to it's an acquired taste, you know, people have to kind of invest in it a little bit to, I think, become addicted to it. Well, one of the things I noticed that you did with me, and I think you've done this in other episodes, too, that I think is is art is that you very deliberately um, consciously craft a narrative around what or from the information you're getting from your guest, right? I mean, <clears throat> from the beginning, I could feel you sort of, I mean, we literally walked from place to place in my childhood in Berkeley and, yeah. and you were the one who was kind of creating the story, which I think that's also, I mean, you're interpreting my, the information I'm giving you and, and making it into something new. Right, you were making it into a new story that I had never thought of exactly. And you had, and in doing so, then you see things differently. I saw my relationship with my mother differently at the end of that interview with you, or well, whatever it was, whatever you call that. Uh, yeah, that, yeah, that, so, con that encounter. Encounter, <laughs> it's a yeah. Casual yeah. encounter. I mean, so that's, that's very much, that's an artist's work right there, I think. Well, I'll, I, I'm, I'm, I'm flattered to hear you say so, and you're, you're totally right in what I am uh, attempting to do, which is okay. exactly that. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I'm looking to piece together whether it's, you know, in your case, whether it's just sh shards of memories, whether it's opinions, whether it's takes, whether it's whatever mm -hmm. it is, whether it's in the ether, whether it's part of the current news mm -hmm. cycle, something, or whether it's not. I try to piece it together into the into a narrative. Right. Um, because that is, you know, narrative has its limits mm -hmm. narrative. And some of my episodes, they have no narrative. They're just, they're all over the place. Just like, just like some, you know, I'm not like, it's not, everything's not this perfectly crafted thing or anything, but I am always looking and spontaneously to do that, which is to tie one thing to the next and to see where, if you put these pieces together, what, like what they reveal. Yeah. Um, and, and I mean, your episode is really the one of the, 
because it was very early. I think yours, yours is episode 14 or 13. I don't remember. Mm-hmm. So relatively early in the, like, because I, because the podcast started only a year and a half ago, not even yeah. um, less than a year and a half ago. So that's kind of where I actually started to realize for myself what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. I didn't know at the time, I didn't start this knowing what the fuck I was doing. I yep. just decided I wanted to do this. And I wanted to, I wanted to rant in the beginning, uh, you know, whatever I had on my mind separate, I wanted to frame it in a certain way. And I wanted to talk spontaneously organically in person with people just as i had been during the entire pandemic in the mm-hmm. only thing that kept me sane which was having these conversations i didn't know where it was all going to lead or how it was going to come together and i started to realize what i'm up to firstly in your episode so you're wow. a very important person in the in the in the uh, uh arc of this of this show but i'm glad to hear you describe it that way because that's exactly what i've always been intending you, since then. you took my story and gave it back to me as something new that's how I interpreted it. That's how I felt it. So thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. yeah. And the story of Thaddeus Russell, because that's what it was. That's that that's what mattered to me. And yeah. it is also this it is also a story of Berkeley. Yeah. You could have yeah, only yeah. happened in Berkeley. Like that's right. the thing that you know, that there's no there's no separation between the person and the place uh in the creative in the in the large creative uh yeah. the whole creative equation, you know. Right. Yeah. Um so I I want to kind of finish by actually talking about politics, but I think okay. it's we're going to talk about some issues in politics that are that are cultural because the culture wars are hot now. Yeah. So I I because <clears throat> I've been very curious to talk to you about this specific thing for a while now. Um, so I was <clears throat> quite interested in the right wing. Um, 2016, 2017, 2018, 2019, 2020. I thought they were issuing some very important critiques that had never been heard before, you know, about liberalism, about the Democratic Party, about the corruption of all of it. And I was not on board with them, but I was a fan and I was watching Steve Bannon's War Room every day and I was following the MAGA, the growth of the MAGA movement and the nationalist populist movement around the world. And and I thought they were doing great. <clears throat> and it was this thing that I'd never seen before. It'd never been in American politics before, like a critique from the right of the dominant liberal discourse. <clears throat> and then they lost their fucking minds last year. Mm-hmm. And <clears throat> with the whole groomer stuff. And this is not just because I got targeted specifically in that, but it was, just, I saw them suddenly get concerned prim- primarily with drag queens. <sighs> And then, then this phantom, this phantom pen- pedophile menace. Who, you know, I still haven't seen any evidence of any of their targets actually doing anything to children. But anyway, they just became obsessed with this thing, kind of derived from QAnon, I suppose. Um, and for the last year, I've just stood back in horror at these people um, and what they're doing because it's it's not only stupid and. Um, silly in some ways it's quite damaging and quite um, dangerous and i mean i'm i've suffered damage from it lots of people have it's a no. brutal a brutal primitive paranoid reactionary politics that i see just erupting after many years of doing of the right wing they're doing very good and productive things but i i feel like there's nowhere in american politics that is worth my time right now well, this is this goes back to the the very reason that I mm. I ran like the Dickens from political discourse because w- as you see, uh, when people get bored, mm-hmm. they either repeat themselves or they become or they or they or they just spout bullshit to mm. entertain themselves, and this is exactly what happened to the mm. the you know right wing discourse slurry cycle. Uh, in the last year mm-hmm. uh, what happened is that for because all the real issues are like first of all trump was this brilliant like cultural gift to the right which the reason why the number one reason they're not never trumpers in the among conservatives the number one reason that conservative that like conservative you know conservative ink people turn were were so against trump was not that it made it awkward for them um not that he was a racist not that any of that it's because he I think he provoked them. He mogged them, as they say online. I can't, you know, mm-hmm. like he made them realize just, just like he did to the late night comedians, just like he was funnier than mm-hmm. any of the late night comedians. Mm-hmm. He made them seem like they were at the kitty table of life. And, mm-hmm. and, you know, all, and he, and he completely 
completely just blasted them out of any kind of significance whatsoever. And they felt this, like the journos, the journalists, mm -hmm. the, they felt their own inadequacy and impotence up against Trump. Um, you take Trump, and Trump did this, Trump was the most libertarian president we have probably had in a century. I, I mean, I'm not going to, I'm not going to start grading Calvin Coolidge right now. You know what I mean? But, <laughs> he, uh, was. but yeah. he was, but he was fucking libertarian as hell. He was the most pro gay president of including Democrats. He was ironically, the most that's right. ironically or not is to mm -hmm. me, it seems totally normal because the dude's yeah. a showbiz. He's a Broadway showbiz fucking, you yeah. know, uh, like all the things that were most annoying about con Republicans, he, mm -hmm. Not only did what did he not have did he not uh, possess, but he literally mocked and made fun of to the enjoyment of everyone who That's didn't right. hate him. That's like right. Like he fucking you know he low energy jebbed them all off the fucking stage, uh -huh. um, and and so the problem is that that you know you cannot communicate talent, you cannot you cannot pass on the baton of talent. Like there is no the successors to Trump, you know, like Ron DeSantis. I don't even fucking get into that because I don't want to start a political discourse right specific it's a it's a spiritual thing that matters these people on the first of all there's a lot of ex-leftists a lot of ex-bernie people who've been carrying the torch on drag queens i don't know if you've noticed but there is a lot of ex-leftists oh. who because they're spiritually communist what are they going to gravitate to as they get red pilled due to covid they're going to gravitate to something where they can oh. be where they can just like they don't have to think where they can just spout oh. again a moral high dudgeon uh uh, about the just in the same way they did about free health care now it's about mm -hmm. protect the children the drag queens the this the that it doesn't require any actual difficult reckoning or thought with reality so these people are running the show now um it's it's fucking annoying every the balenciaga thing was fucking annoying the the fact that babies appearing in a commercial was some major scandal is not only annoying but it shows that anyone who's involved in the politics cycle and this to that degree is prone eventually to becoming a liptard who doesn't know anything about cultural history because there's nothing at all controversial about anything in the anodyne mainstream culture we have seen in the last 10 years that hasn't happened 10 times over at any period of the past there's no depiction of sex or right. you know there's no satanic blah 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 there's nothing that hasn't been like main like that that hasn't been done on a mainstream stage to a degree that nobody is even aware of because they don't know anything about cultural history anymore mm -hmm. unless they're among the very few people who care about that stuff like mm -hmm. everything has been so memory hold that in order for people to become outraged anew every three days who's talking about the balenciaga babies now nobody why because it didn't fucking matter because it's a meaningless topic that doesn't mean anything who's talking about drag queen story hour now nobody until the next until a month from now until the next like until june comes around because literally nobody's forced to take their kids to a fucking library as as maria cantalopez reads from the bernstein bears it's just not a thing that matters but it can keep you busy all day long and that's everyone's addicted to this shit like a drug it's it's out it's it's mainly a drug addiction i, I look at it as it's sad it's stupid it's pathetic and it's yeah it's made a joke of the right even as it's never been more necessary to fucking get Democrats out of power so that we can have eggs in the market and so that gas isn't $10 a gallon in LA and so that we can, you know, restaurants can open again until 10 p.m. None of that matters. Oh, there's a war with a million trillion dollars that's been going on for like two years now. No, that's not important. Let's talk about drag queens and their stories. Okay, so great. Congratulations. Oh, let's talk about abortion. That's, that's another real, you know, that's of course the old school version of all this is going crazy about other people's fetuses and i'm not without any opinion about abortion being issued it should be realized that this abortion issue is a complete and total uh fundraising scam on both mm -hmm. the right and the left mm -hmm. and in the and, and every and all of america in, in between gets spit roasted by this fucking stupid stupid issue that could be solved very you know very reasonably through compromise but no Right. We have to turn it into, we have to burn everything for the sake of one or another abortion crusade. Anyway. Right. Let me, let me um, try to play devil's advocate just a bit here. Um, Go ahead. So you have said repeatedly, uh, angrily just now that <laughs> Balenciaga, the Balenciaga scandal and the drag queen story hour ongoing scandal, they're meaningless. Yeah. 
Um, why, why, how, how do you, why would you say that? How, how are they? Well, what's the meaning? Things? What is, what is the, what is the, what is the actual meaning to these scandals? I mean, they're not, of course, when I say meaningless, I mean, I mean, meaningless in the sense of that they are not important. They are, um, yeah. they're not, none of the real problems that face, I did, I tweeted something to this effect, like, you know, where I like captured this entire, like with all the bullshit we're going, we're undergoing. Mm -hmm. First of all, we've just gone through 10 years of authoritarian censorship, the likes of which America has never dealt with on True. this, at this grand scale. There have True. been localized forms of censorship through over the course, you know, through Puritan yep. panics, but never on this like right. Soviet totalitarian level. Mm -hmm. The last thing that matters within that context is the fact that somehow somewhere somebody got a graphic depiction of sexuality through the keyhole like mm -hmm. are you fucking insane these people are becoming are just doing liptardism for the right and it's because and you know pedophilia that accusation is the racism of the right you can yep. issue it on anyone with no yep. proof you can just sort of forever tar them with yep. a word Yep. That, that has no real connection to reality. When you scratch at the surface, they'll tell you, uh, somebody just said about Kobe Bryant that he raped an underage woman. What? First of all, he was not convicted. He was, first of all, he was, he was, he was uh, not guilty. Second right. of all, she was 19 fucking years old. Right. So, but it doesn't matter because now like, I, I don't know, girls are like underage at 30. I don't, I don't know. It's not my problem, thank, thankfully. But um, it, I retired, I, I, I stepped away from the game. Um, I'm playing a different, I want, I'm a goalkeeper. Um, so I, it's not my problem, but you can tell that these are fake. These are fake issues. The idea of the idea of being outraged because there were baby actors in a commercial is not real. It is not a problem you face when you wake up in the morning. It is not a problem you face when you try to order <laughs> coffee at a restaurant 45 minutes before they're closed and they're out of it. Remember mm -hmm. how we couldn't find any coffee in fucking Berkeley when I was there? Yep. <laughs> it's not a problem you face when you're trying to when you're trying to reckon with a with 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 mortality it is not a problem you face when you're trying to uh repair a relationship with someone who uh, with a friend that for some reason is 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 offended by you and you and for some reason you cannot see eye to eye anymore and you need love and you're lonely like not you're lonely the, the problem of loneliness that it's like affecting so many americans mm -hmm. quietly no one ever talks about loneliness like mm -hmm. it's not that's not that it's not that it's not a problem of the economy which is a you know something that you can deal with politically through actually rational discourse. It's not a problem of all the, anything that act the top one thousand things that matter. The notion that that drag queen story hour or a, a graphic de depiction of, which is not graphic at all by the way, mm -hmm. and which is not even sexual at all. Right in a, in a year where there's been never any less like the the, the last decade uh, there have been a few exceptions only in the last year as some experiments have been made to break away from the censorship regime. I mean, there have been some good things in the last year, like White Lotus and Tar and stuff where things have been mm -hmm. depicted mm -hmm. that haven't been depicted mm -hmm. in years. Euphoria had some sex in it. Woohoo! Like mm -hmm. with fake dicks. Okay, yay! <laughs> Wee! Let's bring out the pom-poms. Um, and like, but to, you know, you're, it's, just, it's just a repetition of liptardism, but for conservatives. And, right. it, and, it, and it enables people to be addicted to certain uh, outrage inducing machines on Twitter, on Fox News, wherever, Tucker, Twitter, whoever it is, just start like libs of TikTok, whatever it is. Like you can always log on to your little window, get your daily dose of impotent outrage, which is not, which is going to lead you away from taking action in a way that matters. That's the thing. When you're on your phone going crazy at something fake, you're not doing something real to True. improve the situation. It's, it's a zero sum game. True. Um, when it comes to that stuff. So the more you get people talking about fake bullshit, the less they're going to be paying attention to the real evils that are going on in the world, which is why anytime you see some fake stupid story like a Chinese spy balloon or whatever, like there's a balloon now. There was a fucking the red balloon. That old French movie has been reprised <laughs> to make people like I'm like, I can't believe how pathetic it gets sometimes. But yeah. you know that something else is probably being covered up just I mm -hmm. organically suspect mm -hmm. anytime some bullshit story comes down the pipe. So, um, you know, unfortunately, there's a lot of dimwitted, dull ass, annoying, conservative, quote unquote, influencers, mm -hmm. low talent, uh, uh, a very, very disappointing, very, very, uh, uh, very, un very uncultured, very unlearned, who uh, people really enjoy listening to, despite how annoying they are. I don't get it. It's not for me. 
uh, and it, it would be good to wipe, kind of like sweep them off the stage a little bit. And, uh, you know, f- 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 there, there's a better path. There is a better path. The path of life. Life is just too interesting to waste on that shit. Please. Um, I, of course, agree with you. But I want to I want to keep pushing back a little bit. So I please, take please, it. Yeah, please. I take it that you um, don't think that children have been harmed by being taken uh, exposed to drag queens. No, I don't think that children <sighs> give a fucking shit about some nasty ass Maria Rodrigo Oaxaca Canta Lopez reading from a, I don't think that's a thing because I remember what it was like to be a kid because I'm not an idiot. I remember what it was like to be a kid. I was not groomed by fucking drag. There was every play I went to as a kid for kids, uh, play for like a play for, and I did go to some, I went to a, like this acting workshop thing as a kid, um, which is very useful by the way. They put on plays. We'd had like birthday parties where they would put on a play, Alice in, Alice in Wonderland or whatever, Cinderella. And it was, it was like the funniest thing about it were the were like the male act like the head of the playhouse played Queen Elizabeth or whatever in Alice in Wonderland. Mm-hmm. Hilarious. I mean the kids loved it because it was obviously a guy, but I mean, you know, full on performing in drag. And it was just funny as fuck because it was theater. That's what made drag you gay. Is, that made that's what, you yeah, gay. that's what yeah, that's what made me gay. That's what like li- like literally the least sexual thing in the world. It was just funny because you're seeing literally drag is like one of the early, the most trad um techniques and mechanisms of the theater That's i don't know right. if people have heard of something called the fucking theater when right. at a certain time everything was drag when when i don't know if anybody heard of someone called william fucking shakespeare, shakespeare. whose right. plays were portrayed female characters were played by men yep. because that is the only thing that happened on the stage at that time and That's guess right. what everyone fucking loved it and guess what he is the uh you know he's the founder of the entire uh western imagination so go fuck yourself so yeah these people don't even know what they're talking about there's not there's no serious thing to like there's no debate here there's no serious thing to deal with here kids are not groomed by f- ugly drag queens kids are groomed by pre by when they are groomed they're groomed by predatory relatives 99 percent of the time right. in big you know unwieldy families where people aren't keeping an eye on things um and that's not like i'm not saying anything against big unwieldy family i'm from i love big families but i'm just saying nobody actually cares again when they're talking about stuff like grooming they're never talking about where it actually comes from it's all a giant fucking distraction. It's just like with rape. It's the same thing as with like campus rape and feminism yeah. and all that. Yeah, like yeah. what they'll do is they target things that aren't rape, but that will give them more political power to replace, you know, superior men. Mm-hmm. Um, they will not actually grapple with the, the, what, you know, whatever the problems of sexual violence might be in reality, they'll, they go for the political, the 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 lib political angle that results in mediocrities gaining more power it's the same thing that's happening on the right this is a a way for mediocrities to gain more power by diverting the public's attention from what matters to something that is completely complete at at, at worst a stu- you know I, i'm not a fan of drag queens i don't like i don't like the idea of <laughs> fucking stupid drag i mean you know i don't any drag queen who would read stories to children first of all is not my not my idea of a real drag queen so that's right that's so right. you know, let's let's stop calling them drag queens. Let's just start. Let's just start calling them uh, like you know, cleaning ladies who are lost or whatever. But like, <laughs> I, I don't want to. I mean, th- like, there's no. What you, anytime you're dealing with something fake, it's it's it means you're not dealing with something real, um, and it's a clue. When I say it's it's not real, when I say that kids aren't being groomed, the reason I know that is because. I mean, groomed in the sense that we're, we're, we're discussing on a level of a you know, national emergency right. is that if, they, if it was a national emergency, we wouldn't be talking about drag queens reading from the Bernstein Bears at the library nobody ever goes to. We would be talking about all the cousin, the cousin Enzos you know, or whatever, if yes. that was an actual epidemic. You know what I mean? I mean, yep. when it was an epidemic in the Catholic Church, we weren't talking about drag queens. That's right. We were talking about like literal trials and, you know, uh, cover ups and massive corporate sh- corruption. Like, mm-hmm. what are we talking about here? You know, so anyway. Amen. <sighs> Love it. So I take it you're not interested in having Tina Turner uh, go uh, read stories for children at the she le- can library. Do anything she she can do anything she fuck. Oh, you mean my Tina I mean, Turner? Your Tina Turner. I do not want to read stories to your boring fucking kids. I'm sorry, nothing against them personally, <laughs> but I don't get anything out of reading stories. They can listen to my podcast though. I mean, you know, like they should listen to my podcast. That my basically my podcast is one long drag queen story hour. It's just that you know it's for for only only for the smart kids. I don't want to like. 
it's a groom, it's a it's a grooming pod podcast. A hundred percent. I mean, I'm you know all I ever do is 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 you know groom people into into faithful listeners. Exactly. Yeah. Well, that was beautiful. Thank you for saying all that. And I'm and I was right. I I needed to talk to you about this. Um, <laughs> so yeah, it's just so fucking annoying. I mean, you know, it's it's like. So where are you going next on your travel adventures, the filthy Armenian adventures? Um, any, any plans, any trips planned? I am going to, well, I, uh, let's see. Good question. Well, on episode wise, I am, um, episode wise, the next stop will be Edinburgh where I, uh, I, uh, discovered that David Hume has been canceled. And uh, went on a very, yeah, went and went on a very interesting night tour of Edinburgh, um, and uh, uh, so there. That's next. Um, and after Edinburgh, there will be it'll be Austin, Texas, okay. uh, where I you know Diner Heaven and Perfume Paradise in Austin, Austin, Texas, with my good friend Jack Mason. Mm -hmm. And after that, it'll be Oakland with uh, um, with Griel Marcus. Oh. So those are the three next physical stops. Yeah. And in terms of where my, you know, beyond that, we shall see. Um, but uh, but those are the next three stops. Can't wait. Edinburgh, te Austin, Texas, and Oakland, California. What else do you need? I love what it. Else do you need? I love I love all that. I can't wait to hear it. Um, well, my friend, thank you for doing this. Thank you for having me on your show. And thank um, you for coming on my show. Thank you for doing your show. Thank you for being brave and making art and um for creating something new for thank you taking the stories that we give you and giving this giving them back to us is something brand new that's really a remarkable gift you give to everyone thank you that thank you so much for having me on and and you know like uh you know, really uh put really understanding what i'm up to <laughs> with filthy <laughs> armenian adventures which people can find on patreon at patreon.com yes. filthy armenian it's also obviously a lot of episodes are out there free on every platform. Um, but the Patreon has a lot of the juicy stuff that is paywalled. So uh, give it a give it a try. And I'd be most grateful. I guarantee you everyone listening, if you just go just go look at the episode list and the guests there, you're going to want to listen to this podcast. It's going to be right up the alley of most people who are listening. So this is the guy right here. Go check him out. Thank you, Alec. God bless you. Thank you, Tad. We'll see you soon. Get better. Okay, thank you, sir. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye. This is the Unregistered Podcast, and I'm Thaddeus Russell. To become a patron of the show and have access to bonus episodes, AMAs, and the Unreported News Analysis Show, go to patreon.com slash unregistered. Thanks for listening.